my name is Gay Malin, and I'm a museum specialist with the New York State Museum. Welcome to the Science and Art of Facial Reconstruction. In this video, we will be taking this skull and bringing it to life. In all, I was asked to do nine facial reconstructions, and in this video, you will get to see them all. This will be a journey that takes us from an old almshouse cemetery to the history and technique of facial reconstruction, highlighting both the tissue depth and anatomical methodologies. It will include some science, art, and a bit of magic. I hope you enjoy the trip. Before starting a facial reconstruction, it is important to know as much as possible about the remains, including the location, history, and conditions under which they were found. I'm Andrea Lane. I'm Archaeology Collections Manager at the New York State Museum, and I also served as Project Director for the Albany Alms House Cemetery Excavations. In the 19th century America, the Poor House or Alms House was proposed as an ideal way of solving the problem of the poor. Alms houses were supposed to improve the moral character of the inmates by engaging them in useful work, which included such things as producing their own food and manufacturing their own clothes. The Albany Alms House grew to consist of a complex of buildings, including a 116-acre farm that served to produce food for the inmates and to serve as a home for impounded animals from the city of Albany. It is also known that there was a cemetery associated with the Alms House. From documents located in public institutions such as the Albany Hall of Records and the New York State Archives, it is known that at least 2,400 people were buried in the Alms House Cemetery. As years went by, the Alms House served a different population, the elderly and the infirm. Increasingly, it became a home of last resort for persons who could not work and thus provide lodging elsewhere. The land that holds the National Guard Armory was sold to the University Heights Association, who slated it for development. Since the cemetery was known to exist on the parcel, the Charitable Leadership Foundation, who was providing the building of, on the site, contracted with the New York State Museum to remove the burials that were known to be on the parcel. It was estimated at the time that there were about 200 burials. Excavation began in January of 2002. Eventually, we the archaeologists removed 881 burials. Later on, a teams of laborers removed an additional 500. The archaeologists worked methodically. They would expose the burials by exposing the coffin lines, and then carefully excavate the contents to expose the bones that were within. Each step was photographed, and an osteologist was called into the field to ensure that all pathologies were recorded. The burials were drawn and, and photographed, and um, then the materials, the bones, were removed and taken into the lab. According to the terms of our agreement with the Charitable Leadership Foundation, all human remains were reburied after a period of about 30 days. The osteological analysis of skeletons such as this skull was supervised by Martin Solano, my colleague. Uh, I'm Martin Solano, uh, and I am a physical anthropologist uh, at the New York State Museum, and I co-directed the excavation, uh, and I was in charge of uh, the skeletal remains, uh, the analysis and interpretation of these remains. The way we determine uh, age and sex and ancestry, well, the skull is, uh, happens to be a very good um, uh, way to do that, and in this person, uh, we could tell that she's a female of European ancestry uh, from a number of the features that we see here. Um, there is, uh, for example, we have small zygomatics here, a very small brow ridge, um, and if we turn it to the side, there's very small muscle markings or very rounded skull. Uh, there's other features that, are may, were, that were a little confusing. Uh, for example, the mandible. She has a very squarish, uh, square jaw. Uh, which was a little confusing, but overall the characteristics indicate that she's a female. Um, she has a very narrow nose, uh, very high pointed nasal bones, um, 
very small retreating zygomatics. They 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 lie flat and they don't they don't flare out very much. Um, a relatively flat face, um, <clears throat> which indicates that she's probably of European ancestry. Uh, one of the things that we look at is the 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 closure of the sutures of the skull. Um, there's all these sutures running along the skull here. Um, at s specific points, we uh, look at how, how fused they are together, and that'll give us an indication of age. And for this person, it uh, gave us an, in, uh, an age of around uh, 50 to 60 years old. Uh, teeth, as well, is, ver is very important. Uh, these people had much more dental wear than we have today. Um, and uh, looking at the amount of dental wear on this person uh, also gave us uh, a relative age around 50 or 60 years old. Um, a number of features of the of the rest of the, uh, the rest of her skeleton uh, show that she was probably doing lots of work. Uh, a lot of the people that were buried at the cemetery were uh, of poor social status, and a lot of them were laborers. And a lot of females uh, were domestic laborers. Uh, they did a lot of housework, uh, worked for other people, worked for the more wealthy individuals. And she has a number of features on the skeleton that indicate that, uh, such as arthritis of the spine and the lower legs. Um, and uh, um, here her arm, uh, for example, uh, there's this extra bony spur uh, extending, out, um, extending out from the bone, which probably is some sort of muscle or tendon uh, tear. Uh, and uh, this extra bone uh, grew out from there. Um, so. Uh, and there's also very strong muscle markings on this person as well, uh, very sharp crests, uh, which also indicate that, that she was probably a laborer of some sort. One of the things we can determine is how tall the person was during life. And uh, luckily, her, this uh, woman's skeleton was complete enough uh, that we had the, the, the long bones, uh, the bones of the legs in particular, that, uh, which can be used to determine stature. Uh, what we do is we take the length of the bone and put it into a formula for uh, white females, as she is, and uh, from that we got a stature of five foot two. Hello, hi, I'm Arthur Falk. I'm an assistant professor of surgery at Albany Medical Center uh, in the Department of Otolaryngology. And, uh, I have advanced specialty training in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery, and uh, my major area of interest is craniofacial reconstruction. The skull that I see here um, clearly um, shows some indications of uh, previous injuries. Um, clearly there's evidence of a frontal injury on this patient, and this is probably an old injury. Uh, I can tell that because there is an element of healing that's taken place around the margins of this uh, indentation on the forehead. It lacks some of the sharp demarcations of a new fracture, and there seems to be some evidence that this probably was the result of a delayed injury with some evidence of some secondary bone healing going on there. But I do see that we are uh, uh, seeing an element of some loss of bone on uh, the right side of the uh, nasal side wall and onto the maxilla. Um, some of that could have been an artifact um, or it could be related to an older injury that the patient uh, sustained. Uh, there is some asymmetry to the area of the nasal pyramid as we see it here. Um, that would translate into some facial asymmetry particularly on the side walls of the nose. Uh, other things that I uh, came across here is, is the shape of what we would call the piriform aperture, uh, which is the aspect um, of the base of the nose and a key uh, aspect of how we go about uh, um, trying to uh, put the pieces together in a, um, a true uh, life trauma patient. Uh, we look at the nasal spine projection, um, and in this patient, the nasal spine somewhat deviates off to the side. That gives us a good indication of the direction of the nasal septum. Um, and it helps us also determine uh, just how the nasal base would sit, how the nostrils would sit. Clearly, uh, the patient's dentition um, tells a story of, uh, of, uh, of some 
probably uh, stresses in life uh, and uh, not the greatest hygiene, uh, but the loss of teeth and some si uh, in respect uh, to the upper jaw can affect the way that the soft tissue structures would redrape around the upper lip. We see that all the time in edentulous patients, and so that has a significance to the way one would want to think about the reconstruction. Looking at the lower part of the uh, face, which really um, constitutes uh, the jaw and lower lip segments, um, I, I see an obvious uh, asymmetry to the lower jaw as it relates to the mid-sagittal plane or the mid-portion of the, uh, the lower jaw or omentum. Um, and uh, I hope that information is helpful in terms of guiding these reconstructions and uh, trying to be as realistic as possible with that process. In looking at the skull that we're going to work on, it's also very helpful to compare it with another skull. Both of these are Caucasian females, and by looking at them next to each other, you can really see the differences, and the features in the one we're going to work on pop out even more. For instance, these eye sockets are much larger than these. The shape of the jaw is entirely different, and what's very, very obvious is the size of the skull on this woman's a very petite skull, and on this woman is a very large, almost manly looking skull given her jaw. Uh, another thing that's good to look at, it's good to turn these so that you see the profile. And in this case, you can see the differences once more. The slope of the nose is quite different, remembering that hers is a broken nose. The shape of the brow is slightly different, and again, the length of the face. So this helps us in looking at our original skull and the one we're going to do a facial reconstruction on. These are the tools used in the facial reconstruction process. There are several clay tools and they really are a personal preference. Any will do and you can even make some of your own. In addition, there are several rulers that come in handy. A micrometer, a ruler that's in millimeters where, in this case, it's clear, so I whited out the back so I could see it against something dark. A flexible ruler. This ruler wraps around the skull. It helps me in drawing the line for the Frankfurt plane. A level to create the Frankfurt plane. Leather and sandpaper for texturing of the skin in the end. Clay, again of your choice, an oil-based clay. Some people sculpt eyes in. I prefer using artificial eyes that I purchased from the American Optical Company. In this case, they are seconds since they are less expensive. This is terpenoid, it could be mineral spirits, to smooth the clay and some brushes for doing that. A guillotine I made for creating the tissue depth markers the erasers used to create those and in this case I use pins to hold them onto the skull and the pins can be drilled if not tapped by um, drilling with this Dremel tool and the bit on this is actually one of the one of the uh, pins that I put into the drill bit. Before starting on the facial reconstruction I made a mold and casting of the original skull so I could work on a replica. Now we begin the facial reconstruction process. We need a stand for the skull and there are many options. I simply use plumbing pipes from my local hardware store to create a structure that allows the skull to rest easily upon it and it leaves me with the flexibility to orient it. This is a hole that was drilled into a replica skull that I cast. I'll take this wood stick, slide it in that sleeve, and place the skull on the stand. At this point, I have a lot of leeway for affecting my Frankfurt plane. Okay. okay, before you get started, you have to place the skull in a Frankfurt plane. You take the lower edge of the orbital rim and the center of the ear hole 
and you draw a line to indicate to indicate that. That's this line right here. At this point, I'm going to level my Frankfurt plane, which is the whole point of it, by holding my level here and finding exactly that place where the level works. And I will put that into place with a little wad of clay to hold the skull in place. I'll now recheck it and make sure that I've got that right. And then I have to look at it from the front and make sure it's not skewed one way or the other by finding the bottom of the eye orbits, and that looks right. This is now oriented into the Frankfurt plane. In the 1800s, certain German anatomists, notably Kilman, Buckley, and Hiss, used cadavers to create the first tissue depth charts. They figured that if they could come up with average flesh depths for different points as they related to the skull, then they could achieve a reasonable facsimile of the face as it was in life. Their original purpose was to recreate important historical figures such as Bach and Dante. They used calibrated needles that they would push into the flesh until they felt bone. Although they achieved decent results, there were many problems with the charts. For one thing, there are, there are a number of post-mortem changes in the flesh, such as loss of fluidity. There was also the fact that these cadavers were laid down on the table so that their flesh sagged. In addition, sometimes the needles pushed into the bone a bit and therefore were inaccurate. These concerns were not compensated for at the time. The most recent charts, done with the use of scans and thereby avoiding the issues connected with cadavers, are the most accurate but there's still a major problem. I will illustrate this with examples from some charts. These charts give us the number of people scanned, the mean, the standard deviation, and the range. As you will see, this varies enough to create a real problem. Obviously, when you're using tissue depth charts, you need to keep other things in mind based on observation of the skull. How muscular is the person? If they are very muscular, use the higher end of the range. How gracile is the general skull? If very gracile, use the lower end. Think in terms of muscle groupings when making decisions. Do not treat each point as a separate entity. If you have any indications about weight, try to reconcile the LSU and Ryan and Campbell charts, remembering how each were created. LSU does not use weight considerations, while Ryan and Campbell has made these divisions. This chart indicates that although the mean for tissue depth mark of 14 is 26.8 and the standard deviation is only 4.47, that there was a range of 19 to 38 in the measured skulls, which is huge. Again, you will have to take into consideration the general information from the skull in determining what numbers to use. Remember that tissue depth markers are only a guideline and that muscle groupings are equally, if not more, important. In the end, I combined the LSU and Ryan and Campbell charts and coming up with the specific tissue depth markers to use for this facial reconstruction. Where there were discrepancies, I considered the muscle groupings and also returned to the physical analysis I had for this individual. Now we're ready to actually make the tissue depth markers. I made this guillotine using a straight edge razor and a measurer, and I slide the, the erasers through it and cut it to the depths that I have on my chart. As I go along, I number them for the different points that are on the skull. Some of them are doubles because they're on both the right and left side of the skull, and some are singles. And I continue this process of cutting and numbering until I have them all created. At that point, I start attaching them to the skull. I take my Dremel tool with my bit and drill a tiny hole. And after that's done, I take a straight pin that I snip off the um, rounded edge so that it can slide the eraser onto the point. This is 
also better than gluing in that I can take them on and off if they get in my way at certain points in the process. Occasionally I need to tap it in a little bit to get it down far enough if the tissue depth marker is very small. And I continue this process over the entire skull until they're all done. I have firmly now anchored the head to a base and I've given it a pseudo neck for the time being. Um, I chose this angle for the base because when the neck is finally sculpted in, I don't want to go beyond where the vertebral column begins because we have no information on it. Eventually, this will be used in a museum exhibition and will be on this base which, as you can see, matches the angle here. The next thing we're going to be doing is placing the eyes in the sockets. To do that, we need to draw a line from this point, where you can see the nose beginning, straight across. And then we need to take a line down from the center of the eye this way. That gives us where the, the center of the eye is. In order to do this and have a little bit of room for my hands, I'm going to remove these couple of tissue depth markers so I can reach in more easily without them being in my way. Um, because the eyes are concave, I'm going to build up a little bit of clay. I'm also first just going to extend these white lines up a little, down a little bit so that I'll be able to see it as I'm putting clay in. So, we're gonna so I'm going to build a little bit of clay up in the eye socket, like this. And also just a little bit up in the ridge area here so that I can hold it in a little bit better. just keeping to the orbit of the eye. I'm going to take one of my tools now and go back and create that line in the clay so that I can see it, still see it. And then I'm going to take one of the eyes and place it so that that center, I have a little too much clay on this side, so let's remove some. So that that center of the eye and I'm going to make sure that I've done that. Let me just see. The center here. Here, no, I'm down a little too low. I have to put it up just a little bit higher. Try that again this way. There. And there, looks like I've got it centered. Now, in order to give it the right orientation this way, I turn the skull to the side, and I take something flat, and the very center of the eye should be flat against this when pressed against the bony part of the skull. So I press until I have that lined up just so with the flat of this. Okay, we can return the tissue depth markers to their places and step back and take a look to see if those eyes read as if they're looking right at you. I prefer to use the anatomical method and when I'm sculpting and just use the tissue depths as more or less of a guideline. So there are several major muscles that influence how the surface of the face looks. And the first muscle that I'll be sculpting in is called the temporalis. It goes from the temporal line here 
down to the top of the mandible, which is right over here. So we're going to be sculpting this in, filling this area in with the temporalis muscle, which is a fan-shaped muscle, as you can see, that follows this crest, which in some people is far more pronounced than in her, hers. So I'm going to start by just getting this in. As you see, there are no tissue depth markers here. So <coughs> we will build it in, the fan-shaped method, more or less, although we'll be smoothing it out as we go along. Very little in nature is concave. Almost all forms on a human being are convex. So it should have slightly outward flow. OK, so we've got more or less the two zygomatic, uh, the two temporalis muscles. The next muscle we're going to sculpt in is the masseter muscle, which goes from the um, underneath most of this, this part of the bone and wraps around the mandible. So I'm going to do that next. Comes from underneath, and here's where my tissue depths will be some guide to what I'm doing. I'm going to go around using these tissue depths as an idea of about how far out that will go. I'm just going to kind of fill in this area, but I want you to understand that it's a gland. And so that gland, I'm going to follow right now, I'm not going to go beyond the line of the bone here, although in the end I will come over that, but just so I can still see it. I'm going to go from this point. Keeping in mind the general shape of the parotid gland and also how it lies over the muscles located beneath it. The next thing that we're going to sculpt in is something just merely called the fatty pad of the chin. If any of you will press on your chins, you'll notice that you can usually press in a ways. And that's because there's a big glob of fat right there. One of the things you have to look at when you're sculpting the shape of that fat pad is to see, is this a flat jaw right here? Yes. Is it pointed? Is there a big um, protuberance at this point or not? It'll give you a sense of what that jaw is doing. And for that, I look back to my other skull, which is another replica that doesn't have the tissue depth markers, to see that there's a, just, can you see this? To see that there's a slight, just a very slight protuberance, that basically it's flat here with a very small slope. So I'm going to use my tissue depth markers really to indicate that fat pad. Normally, the fat pad would look like a little pile of dots like this, you know, as, because it's fat. We're just going to build it up and then take into consideration that this chin kind of goes over in this direction a bit, like that. You can see here. This will give me the shape of the fat pad. I'll bring it up to this point. Up here. The next group of muscles are called the orb orbicularis oris, which is a fancy way of saying the muscles around the mouth. Um, to, I'm just going to put in one side of them, more or less. And to get a sense of where the mouth ends, what you normally do is draw a straight line down from the center of the eye. The other, the other um, measurement is to count over three teeth. 
which in this, I can't do it on this side very well, but on this side would be one, two, three. And if you look, that's pretty much where the line down from this eye occurs. So I'm going to go out to about that point with, with this muscle, which is really just a round shaped muscle. We have a lot of striations in real life. We're just going to do it as a mass. So I'm going to kind of go from there, just kind of get it out like this. Now, usually the lip line is a little bit above the front teeth. Again, we don't have many teeth to go on on this side, but On this side we do, and the muscle extends beyond that in any case, so we're just going to kind of get the muscle in. We'll work on the lips later on, but we're going to leave our line so we can more or less see, still see the teeth, but kind of be coming out to the depth that the markers tell us to come out to, which would be about like that. We're just going to really put these in very generically at this point. Oops. Gives us about the depth that this needs to go to. And basically the ubiquitous comes around like that and comes down like this. We're just going to indicate it in this manner at this point. Not worry about it too much and what the mouth looks like because the next muscle that we're going to put in is the zygomaticus, which starts near the arch of the zygomatic bone and goes to this point of the orbicularis orus. Okay, the next area we're going to do is called the buccal fatty pad. It comes from under the zygomatic, zygomaticus and wraps around the chin a bit, and it's what the zygomaticus uh, muscle rests on. And it fills out this whole portion of the face. So we're going to sculpt that in. And we'll use the tissue depths to give us our depth in this area. But it's just a big lump of fat. It takes us around here. It really fills in this area nicely. wraps around the chin. And if we use the tissue depth marker from the chin here, we can kind of get our, our depth. And it kind of comes out from this area and here. So it's basically the area that it takes up. May as well get it to the depth of that marker. And as you see, really starts to fill out the cheek area of this head. We're going to do it on the other side. As you see, she's starting to get a rounded, more rounded look. And we've maintained the bone that we're following. Okay. The next muscle that forms the surface of the face is called the zygomaticus. About where tissue depth 17 is and goes to the corner of the orbicularis oris. And it's a very small muscle and we're just going to lay it in. But it's a very important one in, in the surface of the face. Oops. And it's actually a fairly thin muscle, so I have it a little too thick here. And you just sort of put it, oops, again, it's a little bit too, too large here for doing this. It looks, it kind of contours to the face, a little bit smaller than this, and rests on that fat pad, which we 
I put in before, and up here would have the thickness of this tissue depth, which really forms a good portion of the cheek, comes down like that into the corner of the mouth. I'm going to do that on the other side, but you see from the front the kind of line that it gives right here to this person's face. A very, very important muscle. We're going to fill in a little bit up here. This is pretty easy. There is a, a muscle that kind of goes back on the skull up here. And it really just goes straight back. And so I'm going to use these tissue depth markers. And I rolled out some clay that's to the same depth as that. And basically, this just follows the, the shape of the skull. You press it on pretty, pretty well to the depth of that marker. Take another piece, again to the depth of the marker, try to kind of line it up here. It starts to fill this area in a bit. Instead of just putting a solid strip, I'm going to start around the tissue depth marker, get my depth oriented correctly, leave my indentation showing. We will continue doing this around the back of the head and along the other side. And as you can see, this is starting now to give us more and more, albeit a very rough sense, of how her head is filling out. Okay, we're going to frame the eyes. And the first thing we're going to do is just go around the circular area of the eyes. Just between the tissue depth markers, following the eye orbit, so that we don't change the shape of the eye orbit. Just kind of come around. This will fill in this whole area. And keeping the orbital rim clear so that we can see exactly where we need to go. And we'll smooth into this tissue depth over here, too, to kind of fill this out. I'm also going to same time, bring this clay down from the forehead area to that tissue depth marker. Blend it in a bit. I'm going to make the lower eyelid first, remembering that the inside corner of the eye is a little lower than the outside to accommodate for the tear duct. If it was up higher, the tears could not flow. So it's good to understand the rationale. You make a thin piece, you place it there. You follow the bottom of the eye and press it around to the shape of the eye and into the corners. Okay. And if you noticed, when we were working on her at the beginning, she has very small 
eye openings for her, for her eyes. So her eyes are going to th- probably look kind of large in her face. Putting that to show where the tear duct might go. Just sculpt that around. Make sure it's down in there. And then we're going to put an upper eyelid in following the slant of her eye orbit, which you can see better on the skull. The other part of the eye is the sac underneath the eye. Do you remember my telling you that nothing in uh, nature is usually um, concave? We need to fill this area in a bit. Also, knowing that she's a woman in her 50s, this might be a little puffy, a little more emphasized than if she were younger. Now, in older people, the eyelids tend to droop a bit, and I'll probably go back and make them a little droopier in this area, bringing it more like this and resting more on the lid. But that's all in the details, and I will get back to that later on to show a little bit of her age. After all, she's in her 50s, and she had a pretty rough life. Another important factor um, in making this read as a face is to give her some ears. Before we can do that, we need to attach the major neck muscles. This area here, which I've left, is an area of which a major muscle of the neck is placed. And we can, we're just going to rough this in for right now, just to get a sense. This is one of the major muscles. It fans up to about this point. Oops. And we're only doing this so we can tack ears on to give it a look. Usually the neck extends a little bit outside the jaw. And we'll work on that too later on a little bit more. Just kind of want to get it in. But I want to just tack the ears on because it will really give a difference to how this face looks. So we're going to do that major muscle there for the neck. I'm going to go around to the back. And you'll notice that there's a, a ridge in the back of the neck. But it tells us where the neck and the skull come together. I've seen facial reconstructions without necks, and they look very strange. So these two muscles would be going off to the sides. We're just going to Put them in there just so you know where it comes from. There's usually a space in between, and they, these go way off to the side like that. We won't spend the time to do that. Um, most of us standing still, thinking of s- our parents even couldn't identify their ears if we gave them a list, but you need them to fill out a face. And so the two rules are that here's the hole, here's the jawline. So we're going to slant the ear to meet the jawline. And that usually the height of the ear is from the center of the eye where it meets, where it meets to the bottom of the nose. And these are the molds. These are for my larger ears for my larger skulls. And I just cast them because it's very easy to poke them as you go along. Made my life easier. But I have these sculpted already. And I'm going to just following the idea of the center of the ear to the center hole, following the slant of the jaw. I'm just going to press that there just for right now because you'll see what a difference. And I'm going to just back it up a little bit because I'm going to have to spend a little time getting them in perfectly. And then these would be put in. 
I'm going to put the other one because it really changes how this face looks. And I like to do it just to keep, keep it looking good. If you look on this size of this ear, that is to the center point there. That is to this point here. It's a golden rule of um, ears if you don't have ones like I do. The bone gives few clues other than placement about the shape of the ear. Therefore, it is best to use a generic ear for the shape and the golden rule for its size. I'm going to remove this because I want to show you something on the, on the mouth that we didn't get to look at yesterday. Now, one of the things to notice on her, first of all, is that she's got a little bit of an overbite. Her top teeth are out further than the bottom, so her mouth is going to, going to reflect that. Because she lost a few teeth prior to her death, her lip would have a pucker in it at this point. A couple of other notes. Usually the width of the lips is from the top of the dentin of the tooth to the bottom. Now, again, this is a general rule, and we don't know for sure that that's what someone would have. It wouldn't, certainly wouldn't account for very thin lips that some people have because their teeth wouldn't be that thin. But there are people who almost appear to have no lips at all. So it should come out. This number six is the depth to which this comes out. I'm going to follow it around to there. We're going to stay slightly above that line of the tooth, following the, the size. And again, the two rules are either that the lips are about as wide as the top three teeth over, or that if you take a straight line from the center of the eye down, that is the corner of the mouth. I like to use that one better because it's more proportional to each person. So I've got the corners that these lips should get to. Obviously I have to add a little bit more over here, this one. Okay, fill in this area a little bit, which we didn't do before, so that her lip joins. Bottom of that lip will join into the that fatty pad of the chin we talked about. Kind of get that around. With this part, sort of following the chin, and her lip going like that. So that gives her, basically, her lips again. We'll be doing finishing work later on. So but that makes the transition from the lip into the face on the lower part. The next area we're going to sculpt in is the area directly below the nose, the philtrum, which is the little indentation you have from the um, base of your nose into your lip. And I'm going to fill in a little area here. Now I'm going to try to leave the nasal area open because I'd like to be able to see where the base of the nose is for right now. So Basically, what this is, is to this depth, this number five marker, which is a very important marker for the nose in the end, and you'll see when I get to the nose. I'm just going to fill in this area up to the marker depth, this point. And the philtrum itself is right in the center, kind of make it 
Well, actually, I'm going to leave it off for right now because I have to show you something else and this will get in the way. We're going to fill in this area. And we're going to discuss the nose. Usually the way the width of the nose is figured is that you take a measurement of the widest point of the nasal opening, which in this case would be, in millimeters, 23 millimeters. That's two-thirds of the width of the nose. So if you add another 11 and a half, if you divide that in half, you get 11 and a half millimeters. And then if you divide that in half again, you get the width of, of, the, of the nostrils. So each nostril on a side should be fi about five millimeters. If you were doing someone who didn't have a broken nose, that would be how you would do it. It's a pretty standard rule. In her case, because her nose is broken. It's been indicated that one nostril would be off, would be wider, and the other narrower, and one would be forward and one would be back. So I've somewhat indicated that, and I'm just going to draw, again, another straight line down to show where the outside of that nostril would be and the outside of this nostril. We've got an angle. The other thing is that nostrils are lower than the nasal opening. And it's that way because you wouldn't be able to breathe. But it's a common mistake to think that it's up higher or whatever. So I'm going to measure down 5 to be on the safe side. On that side, and remember, she's very different on both sides. 5 there. I'm going to draw a line following the, the slant of the bottom of her nose. And I now know that these two points are where her nasal, her, her nostrils will be. So that allows me now to fill in with clay around the outside of this nose, which I will do next, because I have my placements. I'm going to keep the shape of the nose. I'm going to emphasize it, because I need to show you something about that. She had quite a bad break, so her nose is going to look rather odd. I don't want to lose my indicator here, so as I'm doing it, I'm just going to keep that line, keep that line, so that I have my indicator what's going on with her. Okay. And you can see this anterior nasal spine. You can see where the interior part has ended, and the anterior goes out. Now, in some people, this slants downward, and some it comes straight out, and some it goes upward. That determines whether the nose goes down, straight, or up. In this case, it's very heavily down, which indicates that the base of her nose is going to be very drooped. In addition to the shape kind of just being, um, if it weren't broken, it would be pretty straight across, so it, it doesn't make a pear shape on the bottom. So she. She'll have um, a droop, but she won't have the ball of the nose be a drooping shape at all. Now, another rule is that you take the length of that anterior nasal spine, which in this case looks to be 5 to 6 millimeters. You multiply that by 3, which gives you 18 millimeters, and you take that from the point of tissue depth 5 for the philtrum, and that becomes how far out that nose goes. Add it to number 5, and that's about how far out her nose comes. I am going to have to put this up just a little bit higher, however. That gives us how far this nose goes. Now if we look at it from the side, and that's going to be the end point of her nose. So remembering that her nose slants off like this, because it was broken from this point. Also, it was indicated that you have a little bit of a hump here because of the break. So I'm just going to put that in now so I don't forget to the nose which normally you wouldn't be doing, but in her case, we will. OK, 
Okay. I'm going to follow the shape of this space inside her nose so that I have the general shape, building it up. Just adding on here because we have to come out. I'm going to take this opportunity right now to go from this point to, now that I've got a little clay behind there, to there, which gives me sort of how her nose goes out. The shape, take this part of the nose, follow the shape. width, let's see, the left one is more horizontal and thinner, and the right is wider and higher and longer. Take it here and thinner, I have to put it onto the, the little hump from the break, and on this side, her nostril is wider and higher and longer. So she's got a lot of things going on here. Much wider, higher up, and longer than the other side. Would basically take that, that form. So we need to indicate the philtrum which is usually the space um, between the centers of the two front teeth. It's about that width. So we've measured that. She's missing a tooth on this side, so we have to measure this one and extrapolate. And we make an indentation for that. Sometimes it's easier to get rid of the, the marker to do that. It interferes at this point in kind of getting that together, so I'll just remove it. So we make the indentation of where that is. And that gives you the shape of this upper lip, too. It shows you where a little bit of that indentation is. So we get a little bit more of the lip shape coming at us. And we will have to do a lot of finishing work on this and smoothing out. But we basically have what she would roughly look like. OK, another big identifying factor for her was this huge dent she had in her skull. And I've left it open till now so that I would remember where it was and waited till I fleshed it out. It has a definite shape. I'm just going to put a little bit of flesh pulling, pulled over this so that she's, she's got it. And it would probably have had a little bit of a pucker in her life. And that, that was a hell of a fall or accident or beating that she had. So I want to indicate that. It's pretty. Yeah. And when I detail it out, I will pucker it up a bit. So I just want to fill that in right now and how that would look. I'm um, also, just so that I don't forget it, I'm just going to put a little line here to remind myself that it's there. Once you remember that the neck is not a tube, that the muscles really define it, even on someone who's not terribly muscular. As I fill this in, you will still, in the end, see the shape. So the shape of her neck takes up quite a bit of mass. And just a tube wouldn't work. You need to follow the shape of her particular skull and filling it in, and so forth. At this point, I will, off camera, do the final clay work. This will include aging to indicate her 50 to 60 years. I will also use some deer skin for texture and add some minor details.
before texturing and finishing your facial reconstruction, you want to take a couple of unusual views. One would be to look at the um, clay from the top and to see how symmetrical you've gotten all the features. Um, in the case of a fa most faces are not symmetrical, you just want to make sure that you haven't gone too askew anywhere. You'd also want to look at it from the bottom. And in this case, if this nose had not been broken, you'd want to make sure that your nostrils and the nose were pretty, pretty symmetrical. In this case, since it was broken, you really want to check to make sure that this is going off to the side the way it was indicated, to check your neck and your muscles down here, to check the chin, and make sure that you had covered all your bases in the facial reconstruction. Now we're going to put the eyebrows in. Um, people do this in a variety of ways. Um, I'm personally not fond of buying fake eyebrows and putting them on because they always look like dead caterpillars to me. In females, I just tend to score the eyebrow in as part of the texture. In males, I would actually take some of this area and build it up just a little bit because ma male eyebrows are usually thicker and coarser than females and then I would score the clay at that point. The um, eyebrow usually follows the bony ridge of the eye and you can look back at your skull for a reference point if you need to and it's usually fairly thin and flat and so I'll start, it comes a little bit from underneath the eye from the, from the eye orbit and you just would lightly score it in, much like that. It ends about here. Um, one rule of thumb is that the arch of the eyebrow is more pronounced in women, and usually the highest point is directly up from the iris um, and the pupil. And I would sort of blend this in a little bit, so just to make it a little less harsh looking. Fill it in some more if I need to. And the eyebrow is then in. I would do this also on the other side for the other eye and when this is, when this is cast and painted I would color this area of the, um, of the eyebrow to emphasize it just a little bit more. Other things that were done to age her a bit was that even though she is not a heavy woman I gave her a little bit of a sag here. I gave her a little bit of sag in some of these other areas because th this happens as you get older. Um, I smoothed some of the areas of her skull with a card to get it smoother and not lumpy. And then I added texture. All skin has some texture. In this case, I use a piece of deer skin and I simply press it lightly on the clay to give her almost a, a fuzz look, a peach fuzz look. Um, it's just adding some pores to her skin and it helps to make her more alive. So I've done this all around her face and that will help when she's finished and take some of that bright shine off and the, pl the plastic look that you can get when things are just perfectly smoothed. At this point, the clay is basically done. She's been textured, wrinkled, been made age appropriate, been smoothed in the places that she needed to be. And if I were doing this for a forensic department, a sheriff's office or a police department who wanted to ID some bones that they had found, I would try to add some hair, a hairstyle. But since this is being used for a museum exhibition, I will stop at this point. I will make a mold and casting of this clay, translate that into skin tone, paint her up a bit, and give her a wig. Hi, my name is Karen Lynn. 
I'm a hair cosmetology educator. On my freelance time, I work for operas and theater. So doing these jobs, basically we have to research the era of which the opera is taking place with the theatrical production, which can sometimes vary according to the production company, not necessarily when it was written for, that can change. So periodically we have to research characters. When we research characters, depending on the era, we can go to various sources. Some are uh, hair history books, which there are numerous. Uh, a lot of them are out of print, so I've sort of developed a collection of these. And the other sources are photography or artwork. Um, in the case of Our Lady here, we could go all three sources. Um, she died in her 50s, late 60s, and I would say that basically at that time she had her hair parted down the middle, swept around the face, and pulled back somewhat. I would give her a more wavy texture because she probably had a substantial amount of gray hair. Uh, considering the circumstance, she wasn't a lady in upper class, so she had a harder life, so she would have grayed a little bit earlier, and she didn't have the availability of going to salons or, or, or money to, to primp her hair or, or beautify herself. So it would be very simple. It would have to be pulled back where she could work and do her job and not get in her way. Um, normally in this era they wouldn't cut the hair real short. No matter what age they were, they would tend to just wear it back. Somebody in a higher stature would have it a little more elaborate, pulled back, curls on the top, sometimes a bit of a finger wave in the front. This is the subject of our facial reconstruction video. This woman, aged 50 to 60 years old, was 5 foot 2 inches tall and caucasoid. She was very muscular in her arms and shoulders and was possibly a scrub woman. She had some severe trauma, evidenced by an indentation in her skull and multiple nose fractures that resulted in a twisted nose. She died in approximately 1915. This male was our youngest facial reconstruction. He was aged approximately 18 and he stood 5 foot 4 to 5 foot 7 and was of Negroid ethnicity. He suffered from a disease called yaws, which is evidenced as pitting on the skull and you'll see it up on his forehead. He was still growing at the time of his death in 1860. This female was lovingly referred to as the Iron Maiden as she was the only specimen found in an iron coffin. She died at age 40 to 45, stood approximately 5 foot 3 inches tall, and was caucasoid. Her skull indicates a very gracile person. She suffered from severe teeth, tooth loss, and she might have died from an abscess infection. She died about 1890. This male died at the age of approximately 50. He stood 5 feet 9 inches tall and was a caucasoid. He had a deviated septum to the right side of his nose, which indicates interpersonal violence. In addition, he had a very big abscess that went into the sinus cavity and also took out part of the palate, which would show some swelling in the final facial reconstruction. And he probably died from these abscesses in 1875. This male is our oldest specimen. He died in either his 60s or 70s, was 5 feet 2 inches tall, and was negroid. He had an overbite, and he also had systemic and long-lasting infections which were noticed in his legs, sinuses, and skull. He was possibly a dock worker and died in 1900.
This male died in his late 40s, stood five feet seven inches tall, and was caucasoid. He had very muscular traits, very big arms and legs, and was possibly a physical worker. He suffered from rickets, TB, severe sinusitis, and respiratory infections. In addition, his teeth were in very bad shape. He had arthritis throughout his body, and two of his vertebrae were fused at the time of his death in 1870. This female was only in her early 20s at the time of her death, stood five feet tall, and was negroid. She has a very gracile skull. She had lost three teeth at the time of her death and also had three cavities in her existing ones. There are indications of arthritis in her legs and ankles, which were activity rather than age-related, so perhaps she worked as a scrub woman. She died in 1905. This male was 32 at the time of his death. He stood 5 feet 3 inches tall and was caucasoid. He had a broken radius, which had healed at least 6 months prior to his death. But in addition, he had a facial fracture and broken nose, which occurred within 2 weeks of his death. His cause of death could be from brain swelling due to being hit with a blunt object that caused the facial fracture. He died in 1910. This male, who died at the age of 40, stood six feet tall. His ethnicity was negroid. He had very strong facial muscles. His teeth were in excellent shape, except that he ground them evenly, top and bottom. He had torn muscles from lifting, which indicated that he was possibly a laborer. He died in 1880.